So quick question, uh, how was lunch? Very good. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. So now you're all ready for the post-lunch session. Uh, our panel to start off the post-lunch session is on career planning. Uh, this time when the organizers were putting together panels, you know, we were trying to figure out what types of panels. It's always a challenge to reach out to the IDMRS people and say, this panel is good or that one is good. So, but that's one thing common that every one of us is always looking for, how to do something in our careers at whatever stage you are in. So we decided to get a few people who succeeded in different ways in their careers after IITM and have them share their stories, probably give you some advice, and you might be able to relate to some of what is your year, and hopefully they'll be also able to provide you some advice in the future. So with that started, let me introduce the panelists. First we have Vic Mahadevan, who is a moderator. Vic has been both a corporate executive in Fortune 500 tech companies as well as startup CEO. Both career options have their pros and cons, he says, but he has done it all, in my perspective, all by holding senior positions in companies such as Exxon, Compaq, BMC Software, LSI, Corp, and NetApp. He loves to watch movies and play golf. And Vic is from Tati. Our next panelist is Balaji Chandrasekharan. Balaji heads the strategy and marketing group for semiconductor products at Applied Materials, a firm that is the number one provider of manufacturing equipment for fabrication of semiconductor chips. In his two-decade career, Balaji started as a process engineer and a, custom, and a customer account manager before making a change to product management, product marketing, and now strategy and marketing where he drives long-term planning and strategic growth initiatives in this group. He is a B.Tech in metallurgy from IIT Madras, holds an MS in materials engineering from Northwestern, and an MBA from the University of California at Berkeley. Outside of work, Balaji loves to spend time with his kids, taking them to cricket tournaments and soccer games in the weekends. And Balaji is from Narmada. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Next, we have Kannan Govindarajan who is also an employee at ServiceNow. Kanan is currently at ServiceNow where he leads the engineering team responsible for delivering the AI ML capabilities in ServiceNow platform. Over a career spanning 15 plus years, Kanan worked at HP and Oracle, where he held leadership roles in research, engineering, marketing, and strategy prior to co-founding DX Continuum in 2012. That got acquired by ServiceNow in 2017. So he's one who did a startup later in life, but he's still young. He received his B.Tech in Computer Science and Engineering from IIT Madras and a PhD in Computer Science from Sunny Buffalo, and an MBA, and an MBA from the MIT Sloan School of Management. He considers, so this is a punch, he considers winning six aside soccer three out of four years his top accomplishment at IITM. And Kanan is also from Narmada. Next we have Rajiv Ramaswamy. Rajiv, so Rajiv gave, you know, I asked him for a bio and he gives like two lines. Okay, this guy has been in industry for a while. So we had we had to little bit, you know, expand on that. So <laughs> Rajiv says, yeah, I made it through this is, this is more. Rajiv says he's an erstwhile researcher turned into a product guy and a business guy. He has done chips, optics, system, and software. He followed his undergrad at IITM with a master's and a PhD from UC Berkeley. He has held engineering and management positions at IBM, Nortel, Cisco, and Broadcom. He is currently the chief operating officer at VMware. He also received the Distinguished Alumnus Award from IIT Madras in 2000. All right. Thank you. And from what I know, he is a very strong bridge enthusiast. That is true. Okay. Run that in IIT and then give that up. <laughs> and Rajiv is from Saras. Yay! Yeah, Saras can go there. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> 
Yeah. Totally, totally. And finally, we have uh, Vidya Srinivasan. Vidya is a general manager for a portfolio of analytic services for AWS, responsible for, I mean, AWS is Amazon Web Services for those who may not know it. Uh, responsible for engineering, product management, and PNL of these businesses. Specifically, she manages Amazon Redshift, AWS Glue, and AWS Lake Formation Services. Prior to Amazon, she managed the engineering team for IBM's DB2 database after spending many years as an engineer. She has a BTEC in computer science and engineering from IIT Madras and a master's in computer science from Georgia Tech. In her free time, she tries to keep up with her four kids who can sometimes be quite a handful. She doesn't look stressed at all. <laughs> oh, you're great. <laughs> Sorry. So back then, Sarin used to be the girls' hostel. Did you guys not know that, by the way? <laughs> so guys, a uh, couple of things. If you could uh, just keep your phones on uh, silent so that you know we give the panelists consideration. The second thing is that since you guys have good food for the stomach, it's time for food for thought. The third thing is that it takes a lot of effort, energy, teamwork, commitment, to put this kind of an event together. So I'd like to thank Nareen and his uh, cohorts for doing a wonderful job. I just have a, you know, one small story. You know, when I was a young product manager, I had a number of run-ins with my boss, and I kept telling him, hey, what's going on? We don't seem to be on the same page. And he said, we need to change. I'm fine, you need to change. <laughs> so without further ado, I'm going to uh, request the panelists to kind of go through their career trajectory as well as kind of the lessons learned during their, you know, tremendously successful career. So I'm going to start with my friend Kanan here, please. Cool. Thanks, uh, thanks, Rick. And it's a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, we just had a 25th anniversary a few years ago, but even that feels like I was just in IIT, you know, what, not that long ago, right? So I graduated in 1991 in, in computer science, and uh, even that was, uh, I just, I was lucky enough to have the right rank or whatever, because Anyway, once I graduated, I, I also I didn't know what to do, so I applied to graduate school. I didn't know I didn't know computer science, right? Because my grades, I was okay. I was a reasonable student, above well above average, but nowhere near the top of my class. <coughs> but you know, I didn't uh, I, I didn't know I, I knew I did not know computer science. So I decided you know I had to go to IAM or you know take up a job or whatever. I decided to go to graduate school where you know I really like you know what like I really like computer science, so I decided to do a PhD. And you know and then when that finished. Um, you know, I had a sinking feeling towards the end, you know, getting a faculty job, etc. was is not going to be trivial. And you know, that was the first lesson that I did not know then that I subsequently know now, that even in hardcore research, what matters, but typically we say it's what you know, right? You know, you publish a lot and so on. Uh, and the reason you publish is because other people know about what you do, right? It's not because of what the work is, right? Other people know whom do you know is what matters. But the trick is, who knows what you know is actually the most important thing. The right people have to know that you're good at something. As long as the right people know you're good at something, right? That's how careers you know, get me. I did not know that, right? So I was, you know, I had good publications in the top conferences and so on and so forth. Uh, but you know, I didn't, I didn't get the kind of faculty job that I wanted. So I decided to join uh, industry. I joined Oracle. But you know, it so happened my classmate was already there. He forwarded uh, to the to the Java group, and you know, I started developing really cool way of embedding Java in the database, and very high tech stuff. Right? Then after a couple of years of doing that, I got this opportunity to join this group uh, at HP, which had just left HP Labs to, to launch uh, uh, this, you know, uh, what was in a new business unit uh, inside of HP. And this idea was to you know, redo how distributed computing is done. So the applications can, you know, those days, you know, Corba and OIL, you know, object click and everything, I'm kind of dating myself, whether the ways you did, uh, you know, distributed programming and so on. And I know everything can be over HTTP, these applications don't have to be in the same domain. They can be separate the firewalls, and you can get you know interaction across companies. Easy. So we got really excited. And, you know, I, I had these demos that we had put together for a security app, for the HP security analyst CEO, which was demo. We'll give all every security analyst a cell phone, where they can get Bloomberg news on their cell with the service that they subscribe to, uh, because of Bloomberg news. And yeah, HP is a printing company, right? at least was. So you could print it any printer in the room. Right? So everything is a service connected to the internet, right? These, so I was the architect of the group that produced that middleware that made that happen. 
we pretty much pretty much put together what is now called you know app servers, right? So, you know, so but anyway, 2001, uh, HP decided to shut that business down and buy an app server company, or rather, rather bought an app server company. And we were like, we already do this, you know, why do buy an app server company? Uh, and they shut this business unit down. And that was the reason I, you know, decided to apply to business school. Then, like, I couldn't understand. I thought we had pretty good technology. You know, we were showing people how to use the future is awesome. Um, and you know, the decisions got made by um, let's say non-technical people, and so you know, I figured you, know, you have to know how to how to uh, what 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 is important to them, right? What is the business thing that people keep talking about? <laughs> so in the business school, and uh, when I came back, uh, HP was kind enough to give me a wide variety of roles. A couple of them, I just you know, I don't want to go, to, uh, go through all of them. I got the first opportunity to manage people at HP in HP Labs, and that taught me you know what is now called servant leadership, partly because they were actually smarter than I was. Right? The people in my team were were actually smarter than I was, so there's no point in uh, you know telling them what to do, right? <laughs> so, so, so the point is you have to become manager only when your job is not to you know is literally to get you're like a coach of a soccer team or whatever, right? Where you know people play position, but the the team delivers more than the individuals put together, right? The team is more than the sum of the parts. So that is that is what the secret sauce of you know being a manager is, and that's what you try to get better at. Anyhow, then, then uh, after I got the opportunity to do marketing for a data warehousing product uh, and you know, run strategy for a you know, $10 billion business uh, at HP. And you know, while all this was happening, you know, uh, my thought process was you know, eventually you know, uh, to run a, you know, um, um, uh, in integrate all this. Right? So that opportunity came when, <coughs> when a friend called me up in 2012 and said, hey, I have a startup idea, you know, this is a machine learning thing, you know, let's, uh, I want to talk to you about it. I said, you know, sure. And, and you know, uh, uh, when, when I was talking to him, you know, there's one piece of advice that you know I heard from John Mogridge once. I don't know, you know, so if you probably know who John Mogridge is, maybe, maybe not. Chairman of Cisco. He was chairman of Cisco. So, <clears throat> so you know, again, uh, some leadership uh, interaction, right? So there were maybe 50 of us, and John, listening to John, right? And it was literally like listening to you know God, right? And he said the trick is, what you can control is preparation, right? You have to be prepared. To accept the opportunities that come your way, right? So, <clears throat> so you're therefore, and you will know when it is the right time, right? And so, when, when uh, Debu called me, uh, you know, uh, like you know, I had at HP, you know, HP was at, uh, I don't know, I, in my in the strategy group, I had uh, in those two and a half years, I had five bosses. So the fifth boss was just coming on board, and I'm like, you know, this was, you know, I'm like, you know, this is, and believe me, I, I can speak to folks offline. I don't want to, you know, randomly, you know, randomly poo uh, poo folks who. Uh, because it's, it happens in large organizations. Decisions are strange, uh, let's just put it that way. It's very counterintuitive. Um, and so, you know, I was like, I, I'm trying my best. I, I don't know what else I can do, right? I can't do anything more. And so, and I think I'm ready because I've done engineering. I mean, I'm, I can get as technical as I want. And, you know, and I, after, what, uh, seven or eight years in you know, marketing and strategy and all that, I knew I could be really bilingual, right? And that's what I like. Uh, that's what I like to present. I'm, I'm bilingual. You want, to, you want to get technical? We can get technical. If you want to, you know, figure out how to, you know, deal with uh, business folks and present to business audiences, then I can do that too. And to me, the, doing the startup thing was a great way of testing the hypothesis. Do I have I? How I? <laughs> is that possible, right? And so, in the option to present itself, I thought I was ready, right? And uh, and uh, we jumped in, and you know, and the trust among the these people I had worked with before, so I, they were our colleagues at Oracle. And, and my only piece of advice for people who, are, who, who watch it, who start up and so on, um, work with people you already know, right? Because uh, trust, uh, there has to be a bedrock of absolute 100% trust. If that just, I've seen too many companies that don't work out because there's the slightest bit of, you know, mistrust or distrust or whatever the opposite of trust is. Um, so, uh, and you know, we, we well, there were ups and downs, right? There all kinds of ups and downs, but, but uh, the three of us were the co-founders, just, you know, Stuck it up, right? Because we believed in each other, right? And we had a few other people who believed in us, and we didn't want to let them down, right? And and, uh, and we got acquired by service now in 2017, and now you know we are kind of responsible for machine learning parts in service now, and and uh, um, I'm back in engineering now. But you know, I'm, I, it's fine, right? I'm, you know, I, I don't I don't feel I don't feel you know any less uh, um, even after doing you know, years of marketing all that. I don't feel. I'm actually, I, I actually feel I'm better at my technical job than I was, when I was just, you know, in, uh, because I, I always have a workbook with the workbook, so I have always pushed back a product. What, what, what exactly does that, how are you going to position that, right? I mean, I'm going to ask all those things in a much more 
um, because it has uh, much more credible fashion. Um, so, uh, so just a couple of things, a couple of key takers. One is, you know, we don't know if you don't know what you're doing. The shortest, you know, it's better to try a few things out, right? Because that's the best way, right? I mean, the, and you know what? That sounds easy to say, but it's not easy to do because you have to convince somebody. Even if you're in the same company, you have to convince somebody to give you that option. So I just know I just got a marketing job, right? I had to convince that marketing manager, even though he was an HP, to give me that job because I was from HP Labs, right? So how, why, why would he? Why would he give me, you know, a marketing job? So, uh, the, so, uh, so it takes work, right? So to 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 and think two steps at a time at least, right? And you want to do the next thing because you want to do something else after that, right? So, so if you even if you don't know, uh, I'm not saying anything five years or ten years, but if you know what you want to do, go do it. That is the simplest and easiest way. But knowing what you want to do is often hard. Right? So, and be true to yourself. Follow that. Great. Thanks so much, Kanan. All right, Rajiv. So I have to start with IATM. You know, uh, in my very first year, I think we had to do a thermodynamics class. How many of you guys did that? <laughs> in my case, uh, the class was right after lunch. <laughs> I tell you, after that big lunch in the hostel, it was really, really hard to stay awake. So if we do our job right on this panel, we make sure you guys remain awake during the remaining part of this hour, OK? So uh, talking about career, uh, I'm not going to try and compress my 30-year career in five minutes, right? Instead, I sort of talk about some of the learnings uh, that I myself got along the way and uh, how those might apply. Uh, so you guys India. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the first thing for me is uh, it's always about learning new things. Uh, it's a, a career is actually a, a long journey of continuous learning, and it still remains a learning journey for me uh, to this day. And uh, every job I've been at, uh, there's been a learning process. And when I feel like I don't really have much more to learn here, then it's actually time to think about what to do next. And uh, that is something that I've certainly pursued. Uh, you know, sometimes by chance, sometimes you know, deliberately so, or uh, every, every job uh, that I've had. And I think I've been fortunate enough to learn along the way and continue to learn. Now, that then, the, the next thing that I would say there is, uh, yeah, be deliberate about the uh, be deliberate about seeking out new opportunities and also don't be afraid of them. Right? Take make use of opportunities. Sometimes it will be opportunistic. Sometimes it will be deliberate. But don't be afraid of the risk. There is really I mean most of us have really very little to lose in any of these things. It's not like you're not you're always going to be able to get a job. You're always going to be able to get a paycheck. Uh, so there is really very little to be afraid of. And change is actually good. Uh, so for me, it's always been about continuously, uh, you know, you know, changing. Right? Every few years, I force myself. In some cases, some in some cases, it's uh, come to me uh, to do something different and something new. Uh, let me give you a, a few examples. Right? Uh, as as my, was mentioned in the bio, started out as a research guy, and then naturally over time, I became a product developer, uh, and then uh, became a, a manager and uh, a business guy over time. But it's also about, you know, for example, during my career at Cisco, I was there for almost eight years. I, I didn't go to Cisco thinking I'd stay eight years. I thought I'd stay two years because I just finished up a startup uh, before I got there. What kept me there for that long was the fact that every few years, I had the opportunity to go run a new business. I started out running the optical business, uh, which is uh, probably the hardest job ever in my career, but then moved on to doing Ethernet switching uh, and, and then to, uh, to data center and storage. And that kept me going because every few years there was something new to learn. There was a new team to work with. There was a new set of business dynamics to understand, uh, and a new set of strategic uh, decisions and product roadmaps that needed to be executed on. And uh, that kept me going. And uh, in fact, after eight years at Cisco, I'd done my rotations and uh, you know done about three or four business units. And I felt that okay, I was kind of getting to a point where there was nothing much more for me to do. And that automatically sort of led me to, to my next, uh, next job uh, at Broadcom. Uh, so, so again, I think uh, you know, make use of opportunities, seek these opportunities. Sometimes they're going to come to you, but sometimes you're going to have to actively seek them out. Now, the other trick for me in terms of managing uh, you know, career switches, especially, has been trying to get into adjacencies. Right? So if you're doing something today, what's the next thing that you could be doing? Uh, and people typically look for folks that have some expertise, right? It's very hard for you to go do something completely different. In fact, people end up going to business school if they want to do a complete career switch. Uh, I've never done that. Uh, but it's always been for me, 
going from something I know what to do to a job where I have to learn something new based on the previous point there, but also a place where I can bring some of my skills to bear and be effective, but it's different enough. And so it's an adjacency. So I'll tell you some of the big adjacencies uh, for me, uh, uh, you know, were, for example, at Cisco, large company doing essentially network equipment. Uh, the next peak for me was at Broadcom, which was a chip company. At first blush, different level in the food chain, uh, you know, you think, what's, what's really the connection? Uh, and indeed, there was a connection, uh, actually. So at Cisco, yes, we were, we were building switches and routers and uh, selling those to enterprise customers and service provider customers. But underneath them, you know, many of these were built off chips. And uh, I always had teams that actually did chips. And uh, in some cases, we bought chips, but other cases, we actually designed and uh, got them done ourselves in, in house. So for me, to make a, a transition down the food chain to Broadcom, which was a chip company, was not all that unnatural. It was adjacent. Uh, and I wasn't particularly a chip guy myself. I was always a systems guy. But it wasn't a difficult transition to make. And it worked out just fine. Now, fast forward to a few years back, uh, Broadcom got bought by uh, Avago, a large merger, and so the Broadcom management team exited, uh, me along with that, and it was time for me to look for my next thing. That was actually a time that I actually had to decide actively to go look for something new. Uh, entirely by happenstance, I wasn't really looking to make a move, but it just so happened that we had an exit. Uh, and uh, I ended up coming to VMF, which is a software company. And uh, again, you would think at first blush, boy, okay, check to systems, to software, right? That's two steps up in the food chain, really, you know, how is that uh, working? Uh, and, and the reality is it wasn't really that different. I, you know, my job at Cisco involved uh, software development. Uh, I'd worked with VMware in the past, I knew the company as well, and uh, it wasn't that much of a switch actually for me to go. Uh, and it was doing infrastructure software, I'd done infrastructure equipment, I'd done chips that went into infrastructure. At the end of the day, these were all related and it wasn't that difficult. So again, the lesson uh, from my vantage point is, you know, as you look to carry, do career switches, think about adjacencies where you can learn new things, but also bring your talents and your capabilities to bear and can be uh, effective. The, the next thing I want to talk about is networking and the power of the network. Uh, I think this is something that's very obvious, but essentially, you know, you're going to make moves in your career by knowing people. And the people you know are going to be the ones that open up roles for you. They may not be the ones that uh, necessarily get you the job immediately, uh, but uh, they might point you to somebody else, who might point you to somebody else, who will find, eventually unlock that opportunity for you. And networking <coughs> is something that you've got to do all the time. Right? It's not something that you do when you just want to go get a job. Right? Nobody's going to listen to you if you just go to them and say, hey, I, I want to get a job. Right? But if you build that relationship over time, and uh, over many years, sometimes it can be 10 years before it comes to bear. Again, I'll give you an ex a personal example. So I met uh, my current boss, Pat Gilsinger, the CEO at Bear. Probably back in 2007 or 8, uh, I was at Cisco, we were building data center Ethernet, and we, there was a consortium with Intel, and he was at Intel back then. Uh, and, uh, you know, we kept in touch. Uh, while I was at Broadcom, uh, we actually went to VMware and said, hey, maybe we should be doing something together. And, uh, you know, he got to know me better, I got to know him better as well uh, over time. Uh, so, now, you know, fast forward almost about eight, nine years after that in 2016, when I was looking to move, uh, he came to me and said, hey, would you be interested in coming to VMware? And, uh, you know, it, and it, it came from the fact that he had known me for many years uh, from an industry connection perspective. We had talked about it. We never really did anything much together, but we knew each other. And not only that, uh, I had built relationships with other people at VMware over time, and there were several people in the management team at VMware that knew me and I knew them, uh, and that was a network that was built over many, many years, some going back 25, 30 years, actually. Uh, you know, so so that that network uh, really helps, but it's a continuous process of of uh, being in that network and actively uh, building out your connections and talking to them, not just when you need role. The last piece, of course, uh, I think again, multiple people uh, would say this is don't underestimate the importance of uh, uh, mentoring, being mentored, and mentoring yourself. Uh, I think that has been you know hugely hugely beneficial. I can speak from personal experience, uh, I'll give you again two examples. Uh, so one was very early on in my career. Uh, my very first job uh, after grad school at Berkeley, uh, I ended up at IBM Research working for, I was recruited by, at that point, uh, by a guy named Paul Green. Uh, he was a very famous uh, guy, very well known in, in communications back then. 
he was actually in his mid 60s and I was what, uh, 24 or something, 23, 24, and just got my master's. Uh, and uh, he had nothing left to prove, you know, he was here invented, uh, he was here built the world's first spread spectrum system. Uh, a receiver that he invented was in every cell phone, okay, <coughs> CDMA receivers. Uh, uh, so he was very, very well known in the industry and he was off to starting a new project. And uh, I had, uh, you know, the luckiest thing that happened to me was I had the, uh, the fortune of, good fortune of working for him. Now, why was that so critical for me? Uh, it was so critical because he had nothing to prove at that point, at this stage in his career. And his thing was all about how could he build a good team of people around him, mentor them, and enable them to develop. So he ended up opening a lot of doors for guys like me. Uh, uh, you know, and, and again, the relationship with him was both personal and professional. Uh, we kept in touch for over 30 years. We worked together for about 10 years. Uh, we both complemented each other. He was a big ideas kind of guy. Uh, and I ended up turning a lot of those ideas into execution and converting them to real products. And uh, that relationship uh, just, just worked, uh, worked very, very well. Uh, and for me, it just unlocked a lot of doors that I probably could not have opened myself. Uh, you know, back then as a researcher, you know, uh, part of the job was to be active in the professional societies and you know, I could participate in conferences, write research papers. The very first thing he allowed me to do was to do all my thesis work, right, uh, at IBM and uh, get my PhD at Berkeley, right, while I was doing that. And so essentially all the work I did at IBM for the first couple of years just turned into my thesis work. The second thing he did was just open these doors for me within the professional community because he obviously knew everybody and help me get, uh, get going. And so that first eight, nine years of my research career was you know, my golden years, I think, uh, and in large part due to him. And we kept in touch till he just recently passed away this year at uh, the age of 94. And uh, that is something that I will always cherish. Uh, another more, perhaps a little bit more recent uh, relationship, I should say, is actually Vijay's, with Vijay's wife, Jayashree. Uh, so again, uh, I hope I don't embarrass you here, Vijay, but uh, she recruited me into, uh, into Cisco back in 2002. And she's kind of become like an older sister to me. You know, we work on and off together, sometimes together, sometimes not together, uh, part of the ecosystem. And, uh, you know, we, we still talk, we like to get together and talk about everything under the sun, uh, all, you know, every, uh, every so regularly. And uh, that relationship still continues to this day, and I cherish it. So, so it's important for you to to seek good mentors and also make sure that you're doing your bit in terms of uh, mentoring others as well. So, anyway, I'll stop there. I think I've gone long enough. So, thank you, guys. Vidya? That's going to be hard to follow. Um, so, I'm going to take a similar approach to Rajiv and not compress my shorter 18 year career and maybe just touch on a couple of things. And a lot of it actually is similar to points that you made, Rajiv. Uh, so the first thing, you know, what he talked about is make sure you're always in job where you continue to learn. And if you think about what prevents you from doing that, because that seems so intuitive and natural, why wouldn't anybody do that? Uh, it's really about the fear of failure, because we grew up in very competitive environments. We've all done well in school and other places. And you get used to success, and it's, it's, it feels good. And to take on something new, something risky and challenging, and to take the risk of not being good at it is, is hard. It's hard for people who are, especially for people who are type A and like to sort of always be on top, top of stuff. Um, and I think just identifying that and uh, thinking through situations, so one of the mechanisms I've always used while trying to push me through that door is to say, a, uh, which of these decisions are one-way doors? Which of these decisions can I sort of come back from and recover from more easily? Uh, so as an example, um, you know, I joined AWS uh, six and a half years ago now, and um, at that time, AWS had zero presence in the Bay Area. And um, I came from, I used to run a db 2 engineering team prior to that. It was a 200 plus person team, a very well-established database, huge revenue stream, um, and all of that. And when AWS came to me and said, hey, would you be willing to come and do something interesting in databases for us? They didn't have the reputation they had today. It was a, it was, they were a control plane company. They were largely running open source software. Uh, it didn't seem like something super deep. Uh, there was no team, really. It was like we were lit literally AWS at the time was one small room with three desks. That's all it was. And I got one of the desks. 
Um, and it was to come, figure out what to do, what to build, build the team, and deliver something. And super high risk. Uh, and scary, because I thought I was in a fairly good position. Why would I do this? It's stupid. Um, but, it, but what got me through that is it was super exciting. I mean, on the other hand, if you think about the opportunity to build a brand new database for those of you who've been in that area, it's, it's a golden opportunity. You don't get to do that very often. Um, and um, and it wasn't a huge expense. Like I, the way I thought through is, if, let me give this a year. If it doesn't work out, I can always go interview at Google or one of these other companies. <laughs> And it didn't seem like uh, it would take that much time for me to recover from it. And I've sort of used that framework since with all the different jobs I've done um, and to just think through situations to see if I'm, I'm being way too conservative. Um, the second thing is actually touches on the theory of adjacency that he was discussing. Uh, so when I was young and naive, I used to believe that if I focused and worked hard and really spent my energy in some area, I'd get very good at it. it was very confident about it. If I just worked hard and tried it, I'm going to get very good at it. And as I started working with some extraordinary people, it soon became obvious to me that you know, there is just no way I could compete with folks where they have natural gifts and talents and natural ability to do well. And you know, this only happens if you're fortunate enough to work with really good people with high performance teams because if somebody is really awesome at product management and that's a natural skill that they have. You, it's very hard to compete with that. You know, it doesn't matter how long you work on it. They just have an intuition that's hard to get. And so that forced me to really evaluate what is that sort of a thing for me? What am I good at that is hard for the next 100 people I need to be good at at the same level with the same level of effort? Um, and so to recognize that, and then I pick jobs that essentially amplify that talent rather than ones that... Uh, so I always want to learn something new and get better in different areas, but always I was mindful of my core competency and what I could bring to the table right off the bat. Um, but while I learn something new. So sort of sort of going a little bit and trying to gain competence in some other area is an easier transition uh, rather than just going off and trying something brand new. So that's one thing. The third thing I guess I should touch on because I'm clearly the diversity panel member here. <laughs> that was not the intent. I know. That's what they all say. Um, um, so I'll. Uh, so as a woman in tech, and I've always gravitated to very core engineering-like jobs. I don't have an MBA. I have a business function now, but I never got an MBA. And I've really been drawn to hard engineering challenges. So that's the people I hang out with. And um, so always I've seen that as a woman, it's easy for me to be liked and very hard for me to get respected. And uh, respected as a technologist. There is a natural, um, uh, natural tendency to be uh, discounted a little bit. That maybe that is not for me or something that I wouldn't be able to really dive in with, with my colleagues. Um, I'll give you a funny example that just happened last week. So it's, it's fresh in my mind. So I was in China for a business trip to talk to our top customers and discuss analytic strategy in China, in the greater China region. And um, I was well, taking a coffee break and I saw this poster that had um, a picture of me. And there was another guy, but there was also a picture of me. And all in Chinese, of course. I was asking somebody, what is this? Why is there a picture of me? And uh, they said this was the poster for the keynote. It was a conference that was going on. The keynote was the next day. And they decided to put your picture because it will make the poster look pretty. <laughs> this is a true story that happened last week. And uh, I was also offered the chance of standing on stage. <laughs> um, so well, I ended up giving the keynote because obviously it's a ridiculous thing to do. But, um, but I think it just, and that's an extreme example, but I think it is very true that not that people are bad, but there are natural biases that people have about uh, women in engineering, where they get discounted. And the other thing is, even today, doesn't matter what my title says, if I walk into a customer meeting that's not properly set up, and a guy is with me, doesn't matter what he does for me and my team, they will assume that I report to him. It's, it's just what people do. <laughs> uh, and it'll take a couple of sentences and, and, and sort of have to establish myself before I get, I get taken seriously. 
Um, so, I mean, the, the advice I would give for at least all the women audiences here, are part of the, uh, all the women here is, you know, this is the playing field and this is the bias that we are in. And, and sure, we can say this is not fair, this is not good, whatever, but, you know, this is what it is. And I think you have to work twice as hard to get the kind of respect you deserve because that's how it is. And so, for example, in any conversation, I end up, um, I don't do PowerPoint, I just go to the whiteboard and dig right in. And that sort of really just sets the stage and wakes them up and says, okay, stop looking at me as a woman. Um, so there are techniques that you will have to develop. Similarly, in meetings, you will have to figure out how you, the voice you use, how loud you're going to be, um, and how you're going to interrupt in a meeting and have your say. And these are all not natural. These are not taught for us. This is not something that you will just learn on the way. I think these are things that you have to do more consciously. Um, and so I think it's worth thinking about it and figuring out how you will make your, you know, live up to your potential, whatever that may be. I think for all the non-women in the room, uh, <laughs> I would say I think um, it's worth it to think twice when you judge your female colleagues. Because not because anybody's bad or malicious, that it's just a natural bias because of the way we've all been raised. And there are many studies that talk about how in a blind study, men and women engineers, if you do an interview, the women gets judged harsher than the men. It's, it's all well established research on that. Um, so in, in, in real life, even in my own teams, I've seen the tendency for uh, managers not giving tough enough engineering challenges to the women engineers on the team, which denies them the opportunity to excel. Denies them the opportunity to excel. Not that they didn't do their job. They were never given the opportunity because they were not thought to be <coughs> capable of it. And so, and these are all happening with, and, and I love these guys, I mean, these are all very, they all have wives and daughters, everything. It's not like there are some bad people that you, none of us know. So, I, I think it's there, and I think we have to be conscious about it and do something about it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you a lot of what you say has to be with unconscious bias. Correct. Right? That's what it is. And most people aren't thinking enough, right, when they talk to women or, a team with women in the workplace. I think if you just put on your thinking hand and you actually think twice before you say something, it goes a long way. Yeah. So firstly, great to be here. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, so my story is about uh, climbing the ladder in a big company, you know, how to come to, uh, climb the corporate ladder. So I applied I've been 20 years. Right? It's uh, a semiconductor company, not like software or the big fan companies that you hear. Uh, so like the one third of my career is started in like uh, engineering and technology. Right? The remaining two thirds is right now in the business, marketing, and strategy. Right? So when I first started, you know, I was just a complete geek. You know, I just wanted to be a technical guy. I would just love being in the clean room. So I like to solve the biggest problems. I have a background in medical science. You know, I have to give by all the combination. I really enjoy doing that. Right. So I did that for like, you know, first part, four years or so, because when I first started a brand new product to develop everything, and then like the whole cycle of, you know, well, it takes four or five years to develop products in the semiconductor industry. It is a long uh, time to develop all these, right? So when I finished that, right, so what happens is, okay, I have to take it to the customers. So at the customer side, you know, I was implementing the same thing. So, and then you saw the business grow from the very first product to like, you know, like 10 products, bring pieces to develop there. The volume ramps, right? So you get about 200 million revenue, and you kind of feel a sense of completion, right? So what next, right? So what, at the point, what started me was, what should I do next, right? In this whole journey, what I did was I was learning a lot of stuff from doing technology, all the pieces that come together, how to work with customer, what what it takes to start in the early stage, what it takes to implement, what it takes to complete it, right? So I started getting more of the big picture view, and I was feeling like, okay, what should I do at this point of time? I want to call these point of times as inflection points, okay? So you've got to focus on inflection points and how you leverage inflection points in your career very well, okay? That's what helps you to grow. So at the time, I felt like, okay, I got a holistic picture, and I was offered the opportunity to go back and do this another product development that will take another six years all over again from ground zero. So I was not learning anything new. I mean, I could use my same technology skills, engineering skills, but I learned a lot more from the experience that I could contribute to the company, right? So then the, the concept of product management and product marketing is very appealing to me, right? So it was a gradual progression. And then like, you know, but in the business unit, wherever you are, you know, if you're good at something, they want you to continue there, right? So I had to look outside, you know, you go there to a different group, and I got an opportunity to do product management first, right? 
So that helps me to manage from the customer requirements all the way to the delivery, right? So I did that for a few years, then did the journey to marketing. In all this journey, you know, when I was awakened, right at the inflection point, I realized, uh, you know, I would benefit a lot from the business school. So I went the journey to the MBA. So I think, again, this inflection point, you should really leverage it. You should not be afraid of the thing. A lot of things they talked about here, right, is embracing change. I mean, it's very uncomfortable, okay? So I went to a new business group. I spent like seven years in some area where I was like the super deep technology guy. The customers loved me, the business unit guys loved me. I had 20 to 30 people always come to me every day, right? So now here I go to the business unit, nobody even comes to talk to you. You're a complete newbie. Though it's the same company, by the way, but it's a completely different technology. So you would start all over again from ground zero. But the fact that you've done all this experience, right? The first six months or so is tough, which is part of the risk taking, okay? So that is the first thing I learned. It will be very uncomfortable, but after that, you start improving, okay? So the combination of what I was, I was doing business school at the same time, I was, I was getting settled in this new job at the same time, right? So product management, product management, I got good at it, okay? So I got good at it because I could see all the pictures together, all the information together, right? So one of the famous things that I remember is about like, if you're stuck too deep inside a picture, okay, you need to come out to see the picture. So you got to balance both, okay? You got to be in the depth and you also have to come out and see the big picture, you can continuously learn. So I did, the, so the, the next step in the journey was finishing the business school. So I've done engineering and technology, I've done the business product management, product marketing, I've done multiple business units. So I was kind of ready and I was looking for opportunities, I was offered this thing to do a portfolio of products. So I was able to, it's the next gradual step, so it ties to the theory of adjacency, so how you can build on the next step. And then, so the adjacency part of like, the, the looking at the whole portfolio, right, that helped me go into the silicon systems, we come look at all the products in the semiconductor group. So then it became strategy and marketing together. So not only marketing, the strategic function was a natural evolution with the business school degree. So I do the strategy planning and the marketing. And then I did a few products and I do the whole portfolio now. Right? So that's, that's kind of been the journey that helped me to grow along the way at each point. But the main thing here is that each point, right, is the product management, the product marketing, there are key inflection points. You have to take it and you have to see how well you can leverage it. And the theory of adjacency is how you can stack them up to accumulate to be grow your skill set, continue how you can continue to learn, and then, so that kind of helps you grow, okay? So again, the first point is about the, the inflection points, how well you play at it, right? The second thing really is uh, how you understand yourself. It's all about yourself, right? How you understand yourself, and then uh, what are your things that really energize you, and what are the things that kind of like tire you? And we do a lot of things in the job. Uh, like, you know, I realize, you know, I can be a program manager, I've done all that, but I find that a little bit tiring because it's kind of over and over again, the same thing, tracking and everything. So then I realize there are things like, you know, strategy in the new areas, new learning really excite me. So wherever you feel energized, use those areas. You can do a lot more in your career growth because it's a natural energy boost. So uh, study yourself and know yourself, right? That's one, right? The next thing is like, you know, what I've realized over time is it's a very competitive place, okay? You got to differentiate yourself. You should know what's your brand, how can you build your differentiation, how you can add different things to yourself. Differentiation, you know, whatever, is not good at one thing, right? just, it's a combination of multiple things. You saw all the panelists, people, like their different experiences. I decided with what Kanan was saying, you become bilingual, both technology and business together, right? I can go deep into like, you know, like a deep discussion with all the engineering committee, because I've had that background, I can go to business background, I'm equally comfortable with all the C-suite executives, I can talk all the language, PNL, to like you know, operations, anything like that. So the combination of stacking up a lot of things give you differentiation. So how you keep on doing the differentiation, how you build up the differentiation really helps you grow. Okay? That's a key different point too, right? The third thing, I want to phrase it slightly differently, is it's a key message I want to say is comfort zone is your enemy, okay? Second thing I want to say, comfort zone is your enemy. You got to like, whenever like, you, know, you, have, you start something new, you actually learn everything, it's very exciting. But after a year or so, you're kind of starting to plan. Two years or so, you're starting to plan out, right? At that point, what is the new thing you have to learn? Goes back to the same message Raji was saying, you know, you'll be a continuous learner, right? What new thing that I can't so that I don't plateau anymore, I'm able to move the curve forward. So I've been consistently trying to do that, pick up new skills, do that. That's really helped me. So, you know, that, that part of the journey about how you, you know, like understand yourself, how you differentiate yourself, how you manage yourself. That's a big part of yourself. They need to think about that. So, so the, basically the inflection points, yourself. The last third thing that I want to say is really about my mentors and teams and the right set of people. So I mean, like, you have a lot of good examples. Uh, mentoring from the top also, mentoring other people, you know. The good thing about mentoring is junior people, when they like you, they also join your team. Okay, so it's a relationship that builds, so you can have a way to scale your 
business. So, so not only you learn from others, you kind of enter new people that you can, you know, groom, right? So, satisfied in that way. But the right, I just want to say how important what Rajiv said, right? The right of kind of people you work with really unlock the best out of you. So I've moved across so many groups and fun. I mean, not everywhere is the same. We really have to try to find out. Again, if you understand yourself and if you know really what kind of management really clicks with you, and I'm uh, fortunate now to work with some of the best people in the company, they get the best out of me, and then uh, uh, so probably some of my golden years in my career right now. So, so those are the three big things I want to say. You know, yourself, uh, sorry, the inflection points, yourself, and the mentors, and the team, and who you work with. So that's largely my messages. Excellent, excellent. I'd like to open it up for questions. I know you guys have a lot of questions, so please come to the mic. They're the troublemaker. Our father. Our father. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I don't have a question, but I want to very, very strongly endorse what Rajiv said about continuous networking. You don't go to people when you need them. If you keep in touch with them all the time, you will always have a year. And don't network because you know, you're weighing up, can this guy possibly be useful to me or not? <laughs> Number two, don't suddenly drop a person because he's fallen out of grace. There are people who lose their jobs, yes. they move on from one position to another. Absolutely. And I've seen people ignoring this, oh, that guy is not, he's nobody now. Don't ever do that, because good people always come back to good positions. And at that time, they will remember who kept up with them and who didn't. Okay, so uh, this is a very vital thing. The second point was about mentoring. That's, the, that's something we found out in this group we started. There are so many IITians who want to give back and they want to mentor free of charge. Because this group called IIT Startup Shining, and I was surprised 170 uh, successful serial entrepreneurs have signed up to be mentors. I say free. Yeah, free. We don't want any money for it. We're a non-profit. So I'm just saying that you'll be surprised the number of people who are willing to help you out. Reach out and it's available to you. Yeah, just to second uh, that, uh, not just for entrepreneurs, there is IIT mentors, mentors for other folks who are interested in corporate careers as well. I want to, I'm um, I'm five years into my job, I'm in engineering, I don't know, should I do an MBA, should I get into marketing or uh, product management or, or, or should I, I want to shift companies, right? Shifting companies and functions typically is really tough, right? Uh, shifting functions within the company is hard enough, right? Uh, it has to be adjusted, right? I mean, Raji made it sound like, you know, it's not so easy, right? Like you, go, <laughs> you, go, you, go, you go to like work, that, that's the point I was trying to make, right? I mean, it's, uh, Yes, it's adjacent, but you know, the other person has to know what you can bring to the table, right? So you got you got to have that relationship, right? And they have to have you know, they have to we have to be credible in their in their eyes, right? That's when you get the opportunity, otherwise you know. So you have to work to, to get that. So I element is there as well. Uh, I'm actually one of the founding members. It's not a spiel for IT mentors, but if any of you want uh, just to sort of talk about you know I don't know what do I do next or or whatever should I become an entrepreneur or not, right? All those kinds of questions. A lot of people, hundreds of people are happy to have that. Thanks, Monish, for your words of wisdom. Uh, other questions? Go ahead, please. Yeah. Uh, so, when we look for a job or a career, like typically we look for, like, say, uh, what prop? Sorry, yeah. I just want to say one final thought. Uh, the story. So, I, I said, you know, when I left HP, you know, Vic here mentored me on how to leave HP. Okay. Because, you know, so I decided to start a company and I brought. I would have just said, you know what, I'll, I'll do that tomorrow and, you know, join the go and we'll, we'll get going. And we said, you know, go ahead and ask for a package. And you, know, you don't know what will happen. You know, I asked for a package. And you know what, I got a package. And, I, and, it, made it, and, it, made it, and it made it, you know, okay, I can laugh about it now, but you know, I would not have thought about it right, at all. Right? So, so the, the reason, you know, uh, the reason I mentioned all this is, yeah, networking is Kedaji is absolutely right. But you never know where, right, the right idea will come from. Right? And, and so you have to keep talking to people. Right? We never know right? where, where the right idea comes. Sorry. Absolutely. Right. <laughs> 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 yeah, <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. So, uh, the question was like, when we look for a role, like we look for the problem the company is trying to solve, uh, my role in that, and the manager. So there are, there are, these, there are these three things, and uh, how, do we, how do we balance like, one over the other? And especially, we know very little about the manager if you have not worked with that person before. 
So, given that uncertainty, how do we decide what role to do and go about that? So the answer is there's no clear answer. Okay. I mean, look, you're not going to know everything about uh, this job. Uh, you do the best you can in, in terms of researching the various aspects of it. Right? There's a company, the shape they're in, the specific group that you want to join, the manager. But you're never really going to have a full perspective on everything. Right? So you have to be comfortable making decisions with some level of uncertainty. And look, it's not going to kill you. Let's say you go to this job and you find, okay, the manager is the best. You have a conversation, see if we can actually fix it. You can get along and figure out how to work together. There's some adjustment required on your side. Maybe there's some adjustment required on the other side. And if it doesn't work out, you know, move on. Right? I mean, so I wouldn't spend the decision so much. Uh, right? I mean, there has to be something in it that is interesting and intriguing for you to go consider it. And if it is, and if you feel that's good, then yeah, the other things are going to, you're going to figure it out as you go along. Very good. Next, please. Hello. How far ahead should we plan our careers? Should it be like a five-year plan, a ten-year plan, or no planning at all? So in central, what do you think about that? All right, let me ask Vidya to answer that question. So, um, so I don't plan very much ahead. I think um, I think about uh, very much about like maybe for the next two years, um, what I'm planning to do and whether I'm learning in my current job and what are the areas I might want to learn next and then start keeping my ears open for opportunities that might get me there. But um, I've not been a big planner. I don't, I mean, I, the thing is I don't know the set of opportunities. I didn't know the things I would, I would never have planned this career. I could, if I look back, I don't think I could have planned it. At every point, I just made decisions where I got a little bit better. I got into positions that made me uncomfortable. And one thing led to the other. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Uh, Good, good, uh, good discussion, and thank you, especially Balaji, for your comments about knowing yourself. Um, just wanted to say, I mean, I'm, I'm in my mid 50s, like uh, some of you are here, and uh, in the last five years, I was only employed for about 18 months, and a lot of that for me was not knowing who I was and what I was good at. And fortunately, now the last six months I've been in a place where I feel really good, but it's not one of these, you know, trajectories that go like that. It kind of goes around in a circle, and you know, whatever. But uh, uh, you know, if you're if you're in that kind of a stage, you know, uh, uh, networking, I absolutely recommend it. A lot of people around here who I've networked with and who know me in the last five years. So some of the people sitting in the panel right there. <laughs> Thank you. And if you have any perspectives on that, we appreciate. It. Okay. Um, so I mean, like uh, knowing yourself, you take a chance and then you go with the the thing that kind of energizes you and you pursue the path, right? You can reveal a lot of good things later. You you cannot foresee everything. I think the mic is too close. Better? Yeah. Okay. Good. I don't have a spot, but now it's good now. So. So, I mean, like, um, if you understand yourself better and you pursue the path, right, I mean, it's not everything is known at a particular time, but, uh, you know, you do the best that you can, but uh, you keep your, as Vidya was saying, keep your eyes open for new opportunities, then you will see a path. You know, when I did a lot of things, I don't see, like, a path that I can see long-term straight growth, right? I have to move around money where you have to try different things. Um, so keep on and keep what you're doing, and then uh, definitely have the faith to work out. Okay, you just uh, pursue it so wholeheartedly. Thank you. Next, please. My question is for Vidya. As a woman in power now, um, how do you help raise awareness about the importance of diversity <coughs> in your field, and how do you get men to help with allyship for women and kind of raising their stature in your field? So I think a couple of different ways to do it. Certainly, um, I mean, I've been in big companies. I'm not uh, some user, I'm not a startup. Certainly big companies in the Valley are really opening up to this, the, the issue that we have. And there are lots of corporate-wide initiatives that people take to raise awareness. And I think participate, so it, it, what I personally do is I do participate in these things and ensure that the set of actions we take are not just window dressing. Because there's a tendency to do things that look good, but may not really have any real impact on how people do things. And so to really give an honest opinion about 
what these things lead to or not lead to and, and bring about programs that actually help uh, and influence those, I think is one way to do it. Um, the other thing is, this is not a very scalable thing, but um, I mentioned about 40, 50 women at Amazon. And, not, and, and, and obviously it's not possible to mentor people, that many people in any kind of deep fashion. But what the thing what we I, I end up doing is I set up a relation, I set up meeting where I get to know them to a degree. And then I end up being sort of the emergency call when something doesn't work out. And it's not always career change, it's like I think this guy is not getting me right or or I think I got unfairly rated or unfairly um, I didn't get this project and I think it's because I'm there are lots of these sort of Weird issues that are not quite HR complaints because that is serious, and you're not sure if it's an HR complaint, but you want to air it with somebody you trust. So I try to personally play that role for as many people as I can and help them to the degree I can. So that's sort of a one on one thing. It's a very uh, satisfying thing for me, but also it's not a very scalable thing. But you know, from, from the set of things that I can influence, that's one thing I do. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Vidya, for your uh, perspectives on diversity. Certainly, it encouraged some of us to add diversity to asking questions. Um, so my question was that in, uh, in the Bay Area in particular, careers at rest and in motion seem to have a very different perspective. This feels like there's a lot of competition, comparison, stress, uh, being made to feel that you're not good enough uh, irrespective of where you are marching along your career. So I was curious, in terms of your career paths, um, what are some of the techniques that you have used to balance happiness of what you get out of and out of your teams um, versus where you are up in the ladder itself and changing your um, jobs? So the question is, uh, how do I enjoy my job and still move up? How, did I look, how do I look at that? Um, so I've never really been focused on moving up as such. Um, I think about, I, I really focus, so one, I'm super passionate about building good teams and very particular about the people I end up working with, uh, at least below me, above me sometimes is unfortunate. Sometimes. But, um, so I've always focused in um, surrounding myself with people who are better than me and inspire me and that has always led us to do things that are, and that are more than what people expected and in a way that has naturally led to career progression. And one thing we do have, like, uh, so to the, let's flip the diversity a little bit. The one thing you do have is you always get noticed. Being one of the very few men, women, whether it's good or bad, what you do will get noticed, more so than other people. So I think you can use that to your advantage. So given that you have the attention, if you're able to go above expectations and focus on building amazing products and experiences and teams, I do think it, in my case, that's what it was because I was not up for political games and thinking about, or even actually, I would say I'm pretty bad at networking. So there are things in this panel that I should go think about. But it's, I've always relied on the delivery of what I did to help me get to the next step. And uh, to a large degree, that has worked out. I'm not saying it's going to work out for everybody the same way, but at least in environment. So I've always gravitated to the problems other people did not want to work on. So the problem at AWS was a very hard one. People weren't sure if it worked out. It was like, if it works, fine. If it doesn't, okay, whatever. Turns out that the service I want was the fastest growing service for AWS for many, many years. Similarly, at IBM, I told jobs is only one issue. And then did well. So those were the things that led me to go further up. It wasn't any big planned, uh, you know, progression ladder or levels or anything like that. Thanks. Thank you. Next. Hi, I would like to thank all the organizers and the people uh, who made this uh, event open for non iitians as well. And I would like to uh, ask a question that Vidya uh, pointed out. Uh, when you find people who are better than you uh, in your career and who have got natural instincts at being good at something, how do you deal with the intimid intimidation of um, you know not being as good as them? You know, for example, if I run into some of uh, some IIT, IIT Madras people at my work, and <laughs> how do I deal with you know uh, how am I going to be as good as them um, uh, in terms of working or uh, instincts and things like that? So hey, uh, can I, let me just push. Please, I feel passionately about this one. By the way, <laughs> this game of trying to compare yourself against everybody else out there is a killer. Yes. 
Okay, it just makes you feel unhappy, it makes you lose self-confidence, and it's not going to get you anywhere, right? I mean, and I know people, by the way, in my own classmates from IIT Madras, there are some, who are always thinking about, okay, well, how do I do better than that guy over there, right? And that's just a recipe for a disaster. I would just say focus on what, you know, you need to do to do the best you can to your ability, right? And, and continue to grow, right? Rather than looking at the world in a, from a relative lens. Um, yes, I'd like to... Uh yeah, I have a question on top of uh, what okay. it's like. Um, if I'm working with people of uh, you know uh, comparable abilities, I'd like to. I don't think, uh, as Vidya pointed out uh, again, uh, there is. I I I don't think there's a scope of large improvement, and so um, what what would uh, if, if, if obviously uh, there are if, if the gap between. The people I'm working with in terms of uh, knowledge and skills, and okay, uh, and what I possess, and um, yes, there is going to be improvement. But how do I uh, how do I keep focused on what I do rather than why am I not uh, as good as them? Is there a problem? Uh, the only thing I will say is I think the mindset. It's not a zero sum game. It's not like you your pie suddenly becomes smaller. No, there is more opportunity than you can imagine. And I think you, are, you tend to restrict the set of choices that you have, which means that you want to multiply yourself with people who are better than you, rather than think of it as if he gets it, I don't get it. And I think it's, it's really a mindset for us to think of it that way, rather than think of it as, you know, it's, it's him or me, or her or me. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Thank you. Thank you very much you know, for giving this opportunity you know, for talking about your career and especially it's going to be a good encouragement for people around you. And so let me, I would just like to supplement, you know, whatever one of my colleagues basically talked about. I am mid-60s. Okay, I have been basically working for the last 40 years. You know, I mean this is this is this is basically a good opportunity, you know, for networking. Networking is the key. You know, that is what I basically caught through all these 40 years in the way. I mean, not 40 years in the Bay Area, 25 years, you know, which is, which is, a, which is a predominant uh, number of years in the Bay Area. So what I would basically like to do is take this opportunity, you know, to network among, uh, you know, uh, IATians or anybody, you know, with whom you worked and then sustain that particular network and then you are definitely bound to really get your next opportunity. So I want, uh, this is the first visit, you know, as far as I am concerned, you know, because I just wanted to use this platform as a good uh, network, uh, you know, institution uh, so that I basically help others too, you know, as part of the Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I have, uh, other than a question, I have a, uh, a thought to share. I really appreciate, you know, this was a, this was the toughest panel for us to try to put together. And the reason being that, you know, we, we are never sure when we try to get you know, when you take technology areas, it's easy to get people who are experts in those areas and have a variety of things. But asking somebody to come and talk about career, you know, there are things that people like to share, people don't like to share. And uh, I'm very happy that this panel really opened it up for everybody to, to you know, see what they did and how they achieved success. Uh, that being said, uh, I also want to say that uh, IIT MANA is something that has been growing in the past few years, uh, for past many years, and it's a good uh, place to come and network. I keep hearing this thing about networking, networking, and Vidya, we'd like to see you in more events. We are a very friendly crowd. Uh, yeah, and, uh, like <laughs> so, uh, that being said, I'd like to give a nice round of applause to all of the panelists.